Well, how's that for some door-to-door -door service? Here we go. Daniel Schoenwald opens up his collection for everyone to see. This one's the annual Norton Mead, right, Tommy? Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. correct. So, Corey and I, your first time here? Yeah. So, is. Daniel's huge in the two strokes. You're going to see almost every single color H1, some H2s as well, and a whole bunch of other cool stuff. So, join us for that and let's check it out. Well, here we go. Welcome to Daniel Schoenwald's collection. See, there's a lot going on here. Uh, I can't, I don't have the time to go through every single bike in detail. What I'm hoping to do is just try to give you some coverage of the majority of what's in the collection and then focus on a few of my favorites. Uh, Adam and I are actually here a little bit early before the main event starts. And once the event starts, this place is gonna get packed with people. So I'm gonna try to work quick. Let's check out some bikes. One of the things that makes Daniel's collection special is that it isn't just bikes. And trust me, there's some great bikes <laughs> that we're gonna be talking about. But he's also got a lot of accents to it that complement the collection. I mean, first of all, every good collection is gonna have a bar, right? That's gotta be the first stop. But he's also got all kinds of like period literature, signed helmets, that kind of thing. Great neon signs. I'll show off a couple of those in just a moment. And uh, there's some evidence here of Daniel's really long and storied history supporting the sport. This bike, is Rich Oliver's from the 1997 season. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, that Rich went not only undefeated this season on this TZ250, he also led every single lap, which is uh, a pretty crazy thing to, to comprehend. You can see advanced motion controls, that's Daniel's company there. And uh, presumably he got this as a thank you for his support. Like any good collection, he's got a little bit of uh, supporting documentation for it. So over here, there's a first place trophy. I'll zoom in on that. And then here, some photos from Oliver's dominance, including this uh, clip here about him winning his 20th straight race. Over here, some more signs. I love these. I'd, I'd have a, a room full of these if I could. But he's got some cool bikes as well, like I said. This, uh, over at Iconic, we've sold a lot of hybrids in the sense that, you know, Norden frame with a Triumph engine, typically called a Trident, that kind of thing. This is a Norden frame with an aerial square four engine. Look at this thing. So four cylinders, kind of like two parallel t twins just stacked up against each other. Uh, this bike, if I remember correctly, was owned by a member of the Southern California Norden Club. Unfortunately, he passed away and uh, Daniel acquired it so that it would be in a good home with all these other bikes, including a bunch of other Nordens that I'll try to show you in a moment. Over here, uh, so I mean, obviously this is a very cool custom. Speaking of customs, we've got two pa uh, bikes painted by Von Dutch. This is a Rudge Speedway race bike. And I, you know, I think at first glance, if you look at it, you wouldn't really know that it was uh, painted by Von Dutch or anything like that. But there's this photo here in the back and you can see this exact bike in the background, as well as some guns. <laughs> but what I really dig is this Condor. It's an A50, or sorry, A5580, I should say. Uh, this was, uh, Condor is a Swiss company, and they, among uh, the bikes that they were making for their home market, they also made some for the Swiss Army. And this was a very popular bike for the Swiss Army, normally painted military green. Uh, this one has had Von Dutch's work on it. So you can see that cool pedestrian slicer. So made in Switzerland logo there. Uh, they use a boxer twin engine, kind of like the period BMWs. And of course you got the Von Dutch flying eyeball right there. So cool, cool stuff here in the collection. Daniel's got stories on everything. I'll see if I can pull him aside at some point, but he's gonna be a busy man in the next few minutes. I think you all know by this point, I'm a huge Bimota fan. 
So there's a couple of bikes I wanna show over there. But I've just encountered something that I've never seen before. It says it's for sale, who knows if that's true. But uh, it, it says floozy on the side. Now, here's what I really wanted to show you. That cool sign up there, and then some really nice tricolore Italians. A couple of Ducatis, a couple of Motos. You have an A51 there with the Superbike kit. Oh, and Kirker pipes. Look at that, I didn't even see that at first glance. Interesting. Quick check to see. Yeah, I was wondering if it would have mileage, but no. Uh, with the Superbike kit, looks like that was removed, the odometer. You have a 750 F1. But what I really wanted to show off, the Bimota DB1, we recently did a Bike of the Day video on the DB2, and uh, this bike that we're looking at right here in many ways financially saved the moda basically i'm oversimplifying but it's a ducati 900 ss that the moda went to town on and uh my only real complaint about it is that it's just completely covered in bodywork so you can't see the frame or the engine or any of those cool things but it's definitely distinctive and they're in high demand right now and of course my personal soft spot i love my tessies I have a Tessie 3D that I try to ride every day. Here's the original, the Tessie 1D. And you can see here that this was the first Tessie in the United States and it was actually used on the cover of Cycle Magazine as part of a story that they did. Uh, there's also a note there about it being the first production Tessie model, VIN number seven. I, uh, I'm gonna have to take Daniel's word on that. I don't know enough about that to, to know for sure, but this is the magazine that it was the cover on. And then the 1D had such a period 80s dash. Look at this thing. Kind of reminds me of like a Honda S2000 there in terms of having the, the revs up at the top. But yeah, everything was digital. This is what they thought the future would be like. All right, well, let's keep going. Complimenting those uh, Italians over there. Daniel's basically got murderer's row of Ducatis <laughs> right here. There's some cool stuff, and there's even a little center section, so I want to focus on that. But again, starting over there, 888. It's funny, it even says 851 on the tail. A super light, another 888. Looks like an SPO, though it doesn't have the one on the tail that I would expect to see. 996. The, uh, the final edition, or the Neiman Marcus, I would think. Let's see here, we can take a little look at the tail. Yeah, the 748L. This is the Neiman Marcus bike. Very rare. Some Senna's that we'll look at in just a moment. And then just look at this. 996R, a Bostrom, a Bayless, 999S, a Fila, 1098R. Oh man. Okay, but let's come back here to the Senna's. So as many of you know, uh, Ducati and later MV Agusta partnered with Ayrton Senna to create limited editions of their motorcycles to raise money for the charity that Senna had in Brazil uh, to help underprivileged youth, uh, you know, develop their educations. And uh, this is one of the three series that Ducati did with the 916, black with the Senna logo. These, uh, this, literally this option, this wasn't available in the US, so this is an imported bike. And here you have MV's take on it. MV did it with a 750cc and a 1000cc. This is the 750cc version. For me, the easiest way to tell is actually the wheels. Uh, they're just uh, very different on the 750 versus a 1000. But what's also cool is uh, Daniel has acquired some helmets that look like Senna's helmets. I, I couldn't tell you if they are authentic or, or not. Actually, there you go. You can see produced under license from the Ayrton Senna Foundation. So presumably they are replicas, but just great little touches for his uh, Senna corner here. Continuing on with a bunch of cool MV Agustas here. The 750 Sport America. You can probably guess where it got its name based on that paint job. But just look at how gorgeous these heads are. <laughs> little velocity stacks on the carbs. This is uh, not factory correct, that paint job, but it sure looks cool. This, however, does look correct. And uh, MV has recently brought back this paint job for a new limited edition of the Brutale. So you can uh, get that at your local MV dealership, although it's, I think it's crazy expensive what they're trying to charge for it. 
Another MV Agusta here. Back in the days when uh, they were winning lots of championships with Agostini. And some modern ones. But it just it's cool to see the paint themes and the liveries staying fairly consistent over the years. It's a good looking paint job. So that's pretty cool. All right, we're gonna switch over here to some Japanese stuff. So actually, I'll tell you what. I'm just gonna peek over here. This is what Daniel has built. This is advanced motion controls. Such an incredible setup and uh, admittedly, not something I have any knowledge to speak on. But he deals with motion controllers, typically for medical equipment. Uh, you know, MRI machines, CAT scans, that kind of thing. And uh, here, let me zoom out. Just, <laughs> but uh, one of the cool side projects that they've been involved with is they actually created the controllers for the, uh, the water fountains at the Bellagio. So whenever you're in Vegas and you see that show, now you'll know that, uh, hey, one of the people involved in making that happen is also a huge motorcycle fan. So that's pretty cool. All right, going down this line, we're about to see a lot of Kawasaki's. Uh, of just uh, mostly, well, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna surprise you. We'll just, I mean, I'm not gonna ruin the surprise. Let's just, let's just get into it. So we've got a GPC 750 Turbo, the Ninja 900. Some people consider this the Tom Cruise bike from Top Gun with a Yosh pipe. Very cool. GPC 1100, the KZ 1000. This is the Z1R that's been turbocharged. So the story with these, Wayne Moulton was an executive at Kawasaki back in the day. They were kind of lagging on sales with this one, and he thought it would be interesting to use some of the leftover ones and uh, and throw a, a turbocharger on it with a company called American Turbo Pack, ATP. Let me see if I can see any branding on this. Oh, there you go. So you got ATP up there. Obviously, the turbocharger. Check out that exhaust. They did this for a couple of years. This is the... Uh, I think they call this color Starlight Silver, although it's definitely quite blue. It's got the coffin tank. And then later on, they also made uh, one of these with a Molly Designs paint job, black, yellow, uh, orange, very, very vibrant. Kawasaki KZ900, KZ900, a 900, a 900. I think you're kind of getting the idea here. He has, uh, he has I think, all the years of 900 production. And then this, of course, is the first year bike there, root beer orange, or root beer and candy orange, I think it is. Another 900. The man himself. Hello, buddy. Hi. <laughs> there you go. Just showing off your Kawasaki's right now. To conf I'm about to show off your H2s. Do you have every year of the H2, is that correct? Every year, every color. Every year, every color. So let's, uh, let's just check them out real quick. Bunch of Widowmakers, the purple, the purple people eater. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna show you a better purple in just a moment. I love, look at these things. I wish they made bikes like this in these color schemes. Here you go. Look at that purple, thank you, sir. Look at that purple. Purple people eater. Look at the bike, everything is just in such nice shape. This is so cool. But yeah, to me, that's, that's like a top three livery for, for the H2. Great gold there. And we also got some H1s, the 500s. <laughs> Blue, orange. This is just ridiculous. Oh, the early ones. Look at that. I always love the logo that they use on the side covers for electronic ignition. My God. I don't, even, I mean, I've been to the Kawasaki Museum at Lake Forest and their, uh, their US headquarters and uh, it's a cool place. I'm, I'm not trying to knock it at all, but. My God, if you want uh, Cowie Two Strokes, Daniel's collection there, what a lineup. I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but today's event is uh, due to the SoCal Norton Owners Club. So Daniel is big friends with them and obviously <laughs> uh, a participant. When you look at all these Dornans that are here, uh, every year Daniel opens up this collection once a year for people, for the public to check it out. and. Uh, I'm gonna be the first to admit that my expertise of Nordens is not tremendous, but uh, I sure can appreciate them. And Daniel's got a lot of them. So as we go here, 
You have a Dunstall Norton. I have, have, look at that logo, that's awesome. 850 there, bunch of Dunstall parts. The John Player Norton, I think they made 200 of these. Very, very distinctive endurance inspired bearing there. And another one, because why not? This time I'll show off the tail. I always love the livery here. I like a little bit of patriotism every once in a while. So you can see that there, just like, uh, as you've probably seen on social media, Adam and I and everyone at Iconic were excited to be just involved in the tiniest possible way with uh, Trackhouse MotoGP, uh, helping them get those bikes in the country and being the, the first uh, US sponsored MotoGP a team in, I don't know, probably two decades. So excited about that and hope, hoping to get more involved with that. But that's, uh, I'll just leave it there, my patriotism comment. And then another uh, Commando 850, and one of my favorite paint jobs. I thought, oh, you know what? I walked right by it. Nor <laughs> he has a high rider. This is a sort of an interesting footnote in Commando history. Obviously, uh, the Commando very popular in its day when it first came out. And then Norton expanded the model lineup. So they did things like a production racer, which you see here. They did a scrambler, which you see here. They did a long range and some other stuff. You can see over here, bigger tanks so of the LR. It's a long range bike there. Our buddy, Bill. Hi, Bill. <laughs> Putting him on the spot, hey, what's up? Uh, but here's, I think, the funniest one. This was their attempt to expand the lineup to appeal to uh, the cruiser sensibilities that the American market seemed to enjoy. So they called this the High Rider, HI Dash Rider. And really, it's not a huge change, you have bars, and then you have this seat. This is not custom, this is factory, the seat. But there you go. A couple of little changes, and it, it's a dramatic difference from what you think a, a commander really is. Here's a fun row. In addition to those Nordens that we were just talking about, he's got a couple of the standard, I mean, just traditional British 650s. So a BSA Lightning, love that side cover there, as well as a Triumph Bonneville 650, of course, but flanking it are kind of uh, different different takes on it. So here's, actually, you know what? I'm gonna start over here. I apologize for shoving the camera around a bunch, but this is Yamaha's take on the 650 parallel twin back in the day, the XS650. Kawasaki themselves actually had a, a version uh, with the, under the Meguro brand, but uh, that was back in the day. This is a more modern take after the year 2000 the Kawasaki W650. This is kind of their uh, their version of the modern Triumph 650. And then another one, the Benelli. It's an Italian take. Again, 650 parallel twin, very popular uh, configuration of the day, but just different takes on it. Kind of cool. This one, this Benelli, uh, Daniel actually bought through Iconic Motorbikes on our auction site from a really wonderful client of ours in uh, New York State. And so, uh, we're, we're excited to be just a, you know, a part of this collection. Daniel's actually an investor here in Iconic, so he's part of the family, and uh, it's always, uh, obviously it's nice to be involved with people that are this into motorcycles. And as I just casually pan to a Bruff Superior here, look at this thing. Look at that. And as I go over here, You'll see that uh, there's a, uh, a letter, a copy of a letter from Lawrence of Arabia to E. Lawrence saying that uh, he had just marked 100,000 miles on his ownership of, uh, of Bruff Superiors over five different, uh, five different models. And so some correspondence between him, obviously this model, very important in the history of, of uh, Lawrence's life, if you're into that kind of thing. In this row, we've got some cool Suzukis, starting with a, a GT750, the, the Water Buffalo, also known as the Water Kettle out in the UK. But uh, the reason why it was called that is because it was a liquid-cooled two-stroke. Uh, so you can see the radiator pretty obviously there. But that led to it getting some uh, cute water-based names over the years. Here's a nice photo of one in a very distinct color that they offer. But we continue on here to Another one, you can see GT750, and they advertise liquid cooled on the heads there. So an orange one, 
a blue one. And then, here's a distinctive bike from Suzuki's history. This is the rotary powered bike that they made, the RE5. We actually have a black one of these at our shop that Daniel's bought that he's having us uh, bring back to life. But um, the one that we have is a second year bike. This is a first year bike. And I personally prefer the first year bikes because they have some pretty cool styling features. So let's take a quick look at the engine here. Again, your rotary motor and all the companies when they were using rotary powered uh, engines would always use some sort of rotary inspired logo to, to commemorate that. You have your radiator, but the coolest thing about this bike, and they only did this for the first year, is the dash. So on these bikes, they had this cylindrical dash with this cover. I'm not gonna touch it because it's not my bike, but when, normally when it's parked, that kind of thing, this is actually closed. So that's a cover that goes over the dash and then there's a mechanism in the ignition when you, uh, you know, power the bike up, it releases a latch uh, down there and then that pops open uh, the dash cover. So then you're ready to go with this very distinctive dash. In the second year bike, they, they basically they ended up moving the dash actually to uh, what you got on the water buffalo. So this configuration here of gauges, this is almost exactly what you saw uh, on the next year production for the rotary bike. But that cool cylindrical theme goes back to the taillight as well. Look at this thing. <laughs> it's not the most elegant thing I've ever seen, but it is different. And frankly, uh, when you look at these bikes 40, 50 years later, that's the kind of stuff that's, that stands out for sure. Well, we just talked about some uh, old Suzukis. Here's some less old Suzukis. We've got a Jigster track bike. Daniel's actually taking that to join us at Laguna Seca. A first year Jigster 750 in red and black with the original exhaust. Sometimes it'll be hard to track those down. People call them cheese graders. You can probably see why. A West Cooley GS1000S. Not so cool. You got the choke lever up here. We're gonna come back to this because that's my favorite, but we got also got a GS1100 and a 500 here. But here's the thing. We got a uh, Suzuki Katana, and that is my favorite in this row. Highly original example with the, uh, the gauges that go opposite of each other and a spin in different directions. I always thought that was cool. But there you go, legend for Suzuki, that katana designed by Hans Muth. So cool. Here's a cool one. We got a Freddie Spencer helmet. I have a soft swap for these because I have the 10th anniversary and then I daily a 30th or 40th anniversary one of these. So this caught my eye, but the reason it's here is to complement this bike. So a lot of you are gonna recognize this paint job that's inspired by Freddie Spencer and his uh, CB race bike, the 750 that was actually bored out to, I think, 1023. So you can see, uh, sorry for the glare, but you can see an image of the bike that inspired this. This, of course, uh, a more modern CBR, probably roughly around 2005 or so. But look at this thing. We got Freddie's signature on the tail. Cool, just naked, or a street fighter, I should say, really, <laughs> version of a CBR. Inspired by Freddie Spencer. Carbon fiber front fender. Got some HRC branding on the, uh, the engine covers on both sides. Olin shock. Wow, look at that setup. Very cool. Daniel's got a couple of BSA Rocket 3s here from the 70s. And uh, this is the second generation of them. They went to blockier styling for the tank and the side covers. But a couple of things. One, Nathan, hello Nathan. Hi. Hi buddy. Just pointed out to me that it's got an interesting three into two exhaust setup. So look at that. The middle header kind of splits for a collector and then goes out. And then to me, the coolest part are the ray gun exhausts. Look at that. It's kind of what, I mean, America did a lot of this in the fifties, but it sort of died out. England was only uh, 20 years behind. There you go. One of the highlights of Daniel's collection is a 1942 Indian Sport Scout. Obviously, we're looking at a book of it. You can see the owner was uh, Otis Chandler, who had a really incredible collection back in the day. Well, that bike 
is right there. And it's got quite a history. It actually was previously owned by Steve McQueen, who on record said it was his favorite bike. I mean, obviously Steve, uh, known for Triumphs and, and for riding Huskies and things like this. But uh, he, uh, he did also love this Indian here. So again, a 1942 Sport Scout. And uh, Daniel was showing me a couple of cool things about it. So obviously on the right side, you've got the throttle. On the left side, you've got a mechanical advance for the ignition. And it is connected over here to this mechanism <coughs> next to the distributor. So that's uh, being manually adjusted on the left side. Uh, you've got the uh, Indian head here, horn. Such a great design. And of course, a little light up front on the front fender. Uh, this here is how you adjust the compression and damping for the spring on the front forks. And then this is for adjusting your steering dampener. See the mileage here, 3,071. The great thing about this is Daniel doesn't just display these bikes. I mean, he's ridden this a few times. He's even let his friends ride it on group rides that they do. Um, the shifter is gonna be this hand-operated unit there up on the left, and then the clutch is a foot unit, so you use that to engage the clutch, and then you have to manually bring it back with your heel there. So it's a bit complicated, and Daniel was explaining that when you sit on it, this is actually, it's a little blasphemy, it's a Harley seat on an Indian, but you have these two independent springs, so if you're going around a corner, it kind of gets a little unbalanced uh, with your weight shifting around. And so you're doing this ballet, this dance of, as you're going around a corner, you're trying to balance the throttle, but as you're doing that, you also kind of need to adjust the mechanical advance. And uh, the way he puts it is that some people get it pretty quick and some people don't. <laughs> but uh, it must be very interesting to ride something like this. Well, there you go. That is the Daniel Schoenwald collection in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed checking it out. If you have any questions, let us know in the comments. We'll do our best to answer. Uh, as always, thanks for watching. And hopefully when Daniel does this next year, we'll see you here. Thanks, guys.